to St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. My name is Richard Wesley, and it is my privilege and honor to be the pastor here. Now, I'm excited that you're with us today. Today is Ascension Sunday, and we are looking at a text out of Luke's Gospel that talks about the Ascension, but Jesus informs those of us that are living and followers of him that we are indeed witnesses. That's the topic today. You are witnesses. Now, before we get to that, Nina Heilman is here with us today, and she has a special announcement to uh, talk about. I'm just going to leave it up to her to explain that to you. Nina, come and join us and talk to us. Reading St. Nick. On May the 1st, District Superintendent Pat Frudenthal uh, introduced us to being the leadership team, introduced us to our new pastor, uh, Corey Alexander, and her husband, Ryan. One of the things that we did that afternoon was to sign, on behalf of you, the people of St. B, a ministry covenant between Corey and our church. And just in case you're interested, there it is, complete with signatures. The ministry of the church is a partnership between the church members and the pastor. We, the members, have a mutual responsibility with Corey in sharing the love of God with our community. It's not all the pastor's job. Over the next few weeks, a member of the leadership team will share with you the ideas that we agreed were necessary for the ministry of this church to continue on a as a positive force for God's kingdom on this corner, Russell Pike and Rossview Road. My topic today is grace. Think about it. It's been nine years since we last said goodbye to Pastor Sandy and welcomed our new pastor, Richard Wesley. Things that we need to consider. It's been a long time since we've done this. So one of the things we need to consider is our pastor is human and sometimes will make mistakes. We need to respond with grace when this happens. After nine years, we're very comfortable with how Richard does things. I'm sure that Corey will probably do some things different, and that's okay. We need to allow Pastor Corey to use her gifts and talents as she works with us in ministry here at St. B. She is a much younger pastor. She'll probably look at how to be in ministry from a different perspective than pastors we've had in the past, and that's okay. Think about it. Between Delwyn Fryer and David Hawkins, there was a 30-year gap. Both were very effective ministers, but how Delwyn did ministry in the 1950s was very different from how David did ministry in the 1980s, but they were both effective. So let us be full of grace and celebrate Corey's gifts. One other thing I was asked to address, because I understand the terminology and everything. Corey is a provisional elder at this time, just like our own Corey Diller. Okay, I'm going to throw out a word here that you probably haven't heard before. You know, the Methodist Church is big on abbreviations. We've got UMCOR. UMW, BOMEC, B-O-M-E-C, the Board of Ordained Ministry Evaluation Conference. This coming March, Corey will be meeting with the Board of Ordained Ministry for her evaluation conference. If successful, she will be ordained a full elder in the United Methodist Church. This is a very high and holy moment for her and for the church. To get to BOMEC in March, however, there's a ton of work that she must submit ahead of time. 
I remember when Pastor Karen was on the Board of Ordain Ministry, I saw the stack of files that she was reading for each of the candidates. The smallest one was four inches thick. So there is a lot of work, and there are going to be times in this coming year when corey has got deadlines that she's got to submit things to BOMEC. Uh, for example, she has to write an original Bible study. Now that takes a lot of thought, takes a lot of time, takes some more time after you rewrite it. It's, it's a very involved process. So there are going to be days when she needs space and she needs grace. And I have full confidence, St. B, that you are going to be supportive and help her grow as a pastor in her time here at St. B. Margaret now has another topic to talk about. You heard from Nita on uh, the covenant for ministry that we made for Corey. And my topic is personal support today. And you heard how much studying that she's going to be needing to do. And we, as the church, need to have ad advocacy for our pastor, Corey, to intentionally balance vocational and personal health, including a regular day off and vacation. So when she's studying or she needs a day to do that or she's overwhelmed, just, you know, even, we might even offer some, something in soy and food or something to help her get through her papers. So personal support, we need to definitely be there for her and make sure that she has, uh, is balanced on her vocational and her personal time. So that is uh, how we can help her out as personal support. Now, while I'm still up here, I want to make another announcement. We are going to have a farewell for Richard, our pastor of nine years. And we are going to join together on Sunday, next Sunday, the 23rd, at four, between 4 and 6.30. We want everybody to come. We have food and drinks, and we'll be meeting out in the, under the bus board in the parking lot. If we need to put up another tent, we will, especially if it rains. Uh, but uh, anyway, we would like for everybody to come and wish Richard well and thank him for his service for the nine years he's been here and to give him that support that he needs as he moves on to another uh, church. And we just thank him for all the time that he's given us for the nine years. And uh, so I just hope everyone will come. This is not just for our congregation, but for those that meet here also. We have, um, and those that watch on YouTube, everyone is welcome, and we really appreciate uh, your support.
Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from Luke 24, verses 44 through 53. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending you upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. Words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So in today's lesson, Jesus promises Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is when Jesus will send the Holy Spirit to give us strength and power to live the life Jesus calls us to live. Now, we're going to celebrate Pentecost next Sunday. And our worship committee is asking us uh, to wear as much red as we can. You see, red is the liturgical color of Pentecost. You'll notice the white will change to red next week. It is the liturgical color of Pentecost that, that shows up in our United Methodist cross and flame. That red symbolizes Pentecost. It is by the Pentecostal power of the Holy Spirit that we are empowered to live God's love that we see played out in the life of Jesus. And Jesus told his followers that they were witnesses to these things. You are witnesses. And Jesus also informs his followers that they are to be witnesses of what they have both seen and experienced. The love they have seen and experienced focuses on the life they have witnessed in Jesus. Now, there are many ways to focus on the life we witness in Jesus, but for these next few moments, we're going to look at four specific strengths or traits, if you will. We're gonna look at the future, we're gonna look at learning, we're going to look at mourning, and we're going to look at grace. We are changed and transformed into the image of Christ when we focus on the strengths God offers. When we focus on strength, we look to the future. It is only by focusing on the future that we increase the potential for growth and the possibility of renewal. As we focus on the future, we will begin to look at options. We will begin to take stock of the resources that we have available. We will look around and seek support and help to live out that future. We will begin asking a variety of questions that we wouldn't think to ask if we weren't looking to the future. We will affirm the ability to live into our mission as we seek the future that God is calling us to. And as we look to the future, we're more able to make clear and thoughtful decisions. Our focus on the future 
can lead to positive, necessary growth. Now, the very opposite happens when we stay focused on weaknesses. In a study of patients with the terminal diseases, researchers discovered that patients used five coping styles ranging from a helpless and hopeless attitude all the way to the opposite of having a determined and even a feisty spirit. Now, this is people with patients that have terminal diseases. And what they observed was that those who possess those determined and feisty spirits live with a higher quality of life and they live longer than those that live in a helpless and hopeless attitude about their disease and life in general. When we focus on weakness and what might be wrong we fall on the side of hopelessness. We get caught up in the blame game of who's at fault for the weakness and the problems and the issues. We get caught up in that so that we no longer see our way forward into that beautiful future that God envisions for us. A focus on strength is a focus on the future. Now, a focus on strength is also a focus on learning. Before growth is ever possible, we learn. James Hillman describes Adolf Hitler as a person who believed in his own rightness and through his conviction that he and he alone was right, he convinced the whole nation to follow him down the path that he led Germany. There was something in Hitler's functioning that was immovable, obstinately rigid. Biographer Robert Waite said, Adolf Hitler could simply not change his mind or his nature. In other words, Hitler lost the capacity to learn. And no growth is possible without learning. Learning opens us to life. It also preserves life. Healthy Christians know the value of engagement, the exchange of ideas, and the validity of, of interaction with others in realms and thoughts and topics that we've not thought of before. A focus on strength is a focus on sharing ideas, dialoguing with others, and asking questions. It is not a matter of agreeing. It's a matter of exploring new possibilities. A focus on strength also helps us know how to reorient and reorganize ourselves after a severe loss. Mourning loss is healthy. It's important. <clears throat> it is hard and challenging work, but it's important work. Being able to grieve and grieve well produces healing. But grieving feels abnormal. It feels abnormal. That's because apart from the severe loss that we've experienced, whatever it might be, the death of a family member or a loved one, or even the exchange of pastors, apart from that loss, the wide range of symptoms that are associated with the grieving process are normal, apart from loss. But in the normal experience of grief, people experience a wide range of symptoms. Again, these symptoms 
when you're dealing with loss, are completely normal. They're to be expected. They're to be dealt with, lived through, understood. These symptoms include things like numbness, tiredness. It can include loss of appetite or a sense of unreality. It can include irritability or, or anger or guilt or aimlessness. It can result in a lack of concentration or a lack of ability to maintain your organized routines. It can result in restlessness. And all of these are completely normal grief experiences. This is how people feel and act after an important loss in their life. This is how they begin to move ahead, to heal, to live again with joy and confidence by experiencing these, understanding these, and moving through these. When we cannot or do not mourn, we become locked in time. We refuse to let go of yesterday's memories. The present is no longer satisfying, and we dread the future. When we cannot or do not mourn and let go, we will try to mold someone else into a replacement of the lost person. As individuals, we might try to do this to a friend or a family member as a church, we might try to do this to a church leader or a pastor. When someone you are close to experiences a loss, help them grieve by being understanding. This is a time when relationships can become more intimate or they may find those relationships uh, strained and tested especially during the first year following a loss. Be gentle, be understanding. If you're the one grieving, understand your pain, your feelings, and those emotions with that wide range are all completely normal. They're to be expected. So, a focus on strength is a focus on the future. A focus on strength is a focus on learning. A focus on strength helps us reorient and reorganize after a significant loss. And a focus on strength is a focus on grace and graciousness. Hans Sale, uh, a pioneer in charting the effect of emotional states on uh, physical health, noted that the two emotions most detrimental to health are vengeance and envy. Vengeance and envy. Conversely, the most nourishing attitude on health is gratitude. Healthy Christians foster a caring spirit and encourage a confident tone. At the heart of their life is the gospel of Christ's steadfast love. Now, each of these strengths are both individual and communal. They're true in our individual lives, but they're also true in our community of faith. Healthy congregations are made up of healthy people governed by healthy leaders. Healthy leaders inspire the healthy congregations. Healthy congregations focus on strength. They look to the future. They are centers of teaching, op uh, offering opportunities for learning. Healthy congregations have people who know how to grieve and how to walk alongside those who are grieving. Healthy congregations are graced 
and gracious. They are spirited. They are genuine and genuous with themselves and with others. They are generous with those who are not currently part of their congregation. Healthy congregations are communities of thanks and praise. So, what does this have to do with being a witness? You are a witness. You. You are a witness. You cannot help but be a witness. Your life, your actions, your reactions, and perhaps especially your reactions, witness. They witness. You witness every day of your life to the people you know and to the people that you come in contact with. What you talk about, what you say about others, witnesses to your love as a model of life in Jesus. How you help others, how you react to anxiety, are living examples or witnesses of your faith in Jesus. You are a witness. Your life plays out every day and witnesses to something through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let that life play out and be a witness of the love of God. Let us pray. All-powerful God, you reign over all the earth, and all the nations are subject to your word. There is no people who can stand and equal to your majesty. We come to sing your praise and exalt your holy name. We have heard the promises that we would not be left alone, yet we so often act as if we believe that we must depend upon ourselves. Time and again we seek to follow our own ways and fail to hear your sus sustaining word. We know that Jesus has ascended to sit at your right hand and to be the head of your church, but we allow controversy to make divisions in the body of Christ. Where we have been contributors to separation, we dishonor you. In your abundant mercy, forgive us our transgressions and restore us to praise you by the gift of your Holy Spirit open to us afresh the words of Scripture that we might be strengthened in our faith and given a mind to spread the good news of Jesus place and glory to all the world as you subdue the nations that would rebel against you so subdue the diseases and the hurt that cause your children to suffer. Receive into your care those who struggle this day with brokenness of body or mind or spirit and give them a measure of your peace. Let us not stand looking into heaven for Jesus' return, but rather to work for the fulfillment of his promises here on earth until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. Hear us. For we pray this in the name of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now please join me in praying the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So you are witnesses. You are. Your life witnesses to something all the time. We, we sometimes think of, well, when we're witnesses, it's when we're doing things right for God. And that is true. But we're always a witness to something. I, I think the challenge in our lives is to witness to the love of God in our lives so that others experience Jesus through us. Now, you're not going to be perfect at that. No one is. But as we intentionally ask God's power and empowerment for us to live that life, and as we intentionally, purposefully live love to others, we become more involved in the spirit life that God has called us to be the witness God calls us to be. Go into your world loving others. We'll see you next week.